What we have here is the the set of drawings that were in the propose, proposal uh, as presented by the design build uh, companies um, and the, the team of companies that were involved with the project. And so this is their proposal. Now this is not the final, I want to clarify, this is not the final as built set of drawings. So this is just their proposal. So things that were, the way they were actually constructed may be a little bit different because the, these drawings were prepared months and months before construction occurred and actually they weren't they weren't even the final drawing so so just to make make that clear to and everybody watching so assuming though that what was built is close to what is showing on these drawings what what happened is this diagonal here is the one that failed number 11 that member is where it seems there were cracks that formed. Now we're not exactly sure where the cracks occurred because that has not been released, that information. But we do know that in this general vicinity, there were cracks. So my assumption is that the, this member was cracked. Okay. Now, that member, in order for that member to have cracked, it would mean that that member had most likely gone into tension. Now, that member how did that member go into tension? So when this bridge was being moved, there were these towers that were moving the bridge. And I'm just going to just generally show you where the towers were located. So the towers, these SPMT towers, there were four of them. There were two on this end, and there were two on this end. On this end, on this side here, the SPMTs were located closer to the end of the bridge. All right. So that, and that matters because this this end of the bridge, the SPMTs were located closer to this this point right here. So when that is the case, and the bridge is being moved, this diagonal member here goes into tension. When it's the bridge is in its final position on the piers, this diagonal member is only in compression. So what I think happened is that the cracks that were found occurred during the move when this diagonal member was in tension. And that's an important point. So and <clears throat> the reason it's in tension is because when the bridge is being moved, this end here has no support. Since there's no support and the support is only here provided by these towers, this is like a little bit of a cantilever. This is a cantilever, and this diagonal member goes into tension. All right, so this is a tension member during the move. Now that tension during the move, this is an important point. This is a cross section of that diagonal member. Either of these two are, are basically the same cross sections of that member. Um, so this cross section shows that you have two bars that are being that are there for pre-stressing. Now, what that means that means that when you pre-stress a member, you basically you introduce compression into that member, and you are inducing that compression to resist any tension forces that may be created. So this pre-stressing which is in all these members. Basically, this table shows that most of these members have pre-stressing pre going on. Um, but we do know that this member did have pre-stressing bars in it because we saw pictures from the collapse. So the pre-stressing bars are there to introduce compression. Now, the cracking that occurred, because these members, because this diagonal was pre-stressed, you should that is pre-stressed to prevent any cracks from occurring. So why do the cracks occur? I don't have an answer. My only my only guess would be that they either were not pre-stressed sufficiently, the bars. So these two bars, uh, they they pre-stress them. They have these jacks that pull an end of the bar. And here here's a section here showing the bars. This is a section view. These bars here. Are accessible well at least this one end here is accessible in this one bar and they're pulled this bar is pulled 
when they're pre-stressing, they're pulling that bar with these jacks. And then they release. They pull the bar, they tighten these this nut, and then they release the, the bar, and that creates a tension. So it basically, you're, it's a rubber band. It acts like a rubber band that has been stretched. Then you, you clamp the rubber band in place, and then you release the rubber band, and that squeezes everything together. This, the, this, so that's how the pre-stressing is induced. So this member is pre-stressed before the move. The move happens. This member is in tension, but the pre-stressing is meant to prevent the member from seeing any tension. Then the bridge is placed in its final position where it goes back into compression. The, the bridge is placed in its final position, and this member, the engineers go out and they notice some cracking here. Um, so that's, that's what happened, I think. Um, that's at least the sequence of what I think happened with the cracking. So now in its final position, this member, instead of now it being in tension, it is now in compression. All right, now that's key. That's, that's an important point. So now that the member in its final position, so it's sitting on the pier, the span sits on the pier, and this member is in compression. So no longer is this pre-stressed condition ne needed because the member is purely in compression at this point. So it's it what it appears to have happened is the bridge was set down. This member is now in compression, and for some reason, the contractor was doing some sort of stress testing, apparently. And what that would indicate to me is that these bars, which are supposed to have a force in them, a pre-stress force, which is provided in this table, it gives you the values that each bar is supposed to have, that that, val that whatever... They were, mon however, they were monitoring it. Indicated that these bars did not have the appropriate amount of tension in them. Now, so that's why, before the collapse occurred, the contractor was out there pulling on these bars. He was he was trying to stress them because number one, the bridge had the diagonal member had some cracks, and number two, his his uh, monitoring showed that. Uh, these bars were not at the correct tension. They were not uh, pre-stressed sufficiently. So he's out there pulling, pulling on the bridge, pulling on these bars, and he pulls and pulls and pulls and causes the bridge to fail. So in my mind, there's no doubt that the contractor caused the failure of the bridge from his pre-stressing that he was doing just prior to the collapse. The bridge had been standing in place for five days. It was standing there fine. Under its, it was supporting its own weight. Contractor comes and starts to, to do this pre-stressing work at this location. He is pre-stressing these bars. He's stretching them so much and introducing this compression force into this member, which is already in compression. So the member is already in compression from dead load. He's adding compression because he's squeezing the member with these post-tensioning bars. So that combination of dead load compression and pre-stress compression is what caused the member to buckle because he exceeded the capacity of the member to, to, to withstand compression by adding all that pre-stress force. And in addition, what I think happened is he was focused on tensioning one bar so there's two bars in each section in the section of the beam of this diagonal so he was focused on the one bar and in doing so stressing the one bar when you do post tensioning or any sort of pre-stressing work you want to stress bars equally as equally as possible and my, what I think he was doing was he was stressing one bar and not stressing the other bar. And in doing so, that also created a, what we would call an eccentricity. So that, ex, that tension force that he's creating in this bar 
is causing the uh, a bending in this in this truss member. So the truss member is in compression. It's seeing an an axial compression force, what we call it. And in addition, it's also seeing a bending force because of this eccentricity from this one bar being stressed and this other bar not being as stressed. So when you have one bar that's stressed more than another bar, that's creating this bending in addition to the axial force which is runs the length of the member. And you don't, when you superimpose those two, a, co a compression in axial, an, an axial compression and a bending moment, you can dramatically reduce the capacity of that member and cause a premature failure. So that's what I think happened. And it's pretty clear that that the stressing operation that was happening just prior to the collapse is is the cause for the collapse. Now that hasn't been nobody's taken the nobody's taken the fault for what's happened and that's because everybody's lawyered up. Everybody's lawyered up and nobody will take the blame until the investigation has been conducted by NTSB and the experts have reviewed all the documents and design drawings and calculations and made their assessment. But in my mind, this is a pretty straightforward situation. Uh, it's pretty, it's unfortunate that it happened and why did it happen is, is the question because this member having undergoing a pre-stressing operation after it, the bridge was in its final resting position a compression member undergoing pre-stressing when that member will never be in tension again is definitely a, a the question it's the question that it's the million dollar question why was the contract why was the contractor out there pulling pulling on the bars in the compression member when the member was already in compression it was not going to be in tension the tension had been already the tension issue was resolved during the move. Now the member was in compression. There was no need to, to compress that member with, with those bars at that point. So that's that's the key. That's the key question. And in my mind, it appears to just be a contractor oversight. The contractor, there was a specific subcontractor involved with the pre-stressing of the bars. And you have to understand, these contractors that are, when they're doing a construction project, they are following a set of drawings that are put together by an engineer and a set of specifications that are assembled by the engineer. The contractor is following directions. He's following what is on this set of drawings. He doesn't understand what's happening. He doesn't necessarily understand why certain members are oriented the way they are why are the, the why the bars are being pre-stressed the way they are he doesn't understand he's just doing what the drawings tell him to do and it is hard for me to believe that an engineer would have told a contractor the engineer that designed this bridge in particular because he was involved with the construction the engineering team was involved this that's uh, fig fig engineers they were involved with the construction of the bridge during construction. They were the bridge designers, but they were involved during the construction of the bridge as a uh, overseeing the construction to make sure that it was occurring properly and the work sequence was being followed as specified. It's hard to believe that any engineer, because this is not that difficult to understand, hard to believe that any engineer would tell the contractor to go out and add pre-stress to a member that's in compression already. Hard to believe. So that's why, in my mind, this is an issue that the contractor took upon himself to do without any approval granted by the engineer of record. And it's unfortunate because the bridge, if it had just been left on its own the way it was standing after they had placed it in its position, the, the bridge had been standing for five days. If, it had, if they had just left it alone, or if they had even just removed 
the pre the bars because these bars can be removed. They're just they're they're going through these. They're in a void that goes through the member. These those bars could have just been removed or just left alone. My guess is if they had just been left alone or removed, that none of this would have happened. This this tragedy tragedy would have just been simply avoided and no one would have gotten killed and none of this none of this would have happened and everybody would have just gone on with their lives and and you wouldn't have me on YouTube making a video about what a simple error was made that uh, did not even need to be done and and I just I guess it's a miscommunication may have occurred who knows what happened there was meetings taking place and you know when you're in the heat of the moment we're we're here sitting we after the fact and theorizing and postulating and trying to understand what was done and and why were they doing it this way but when you're in the heat of the moment and you're you're the engineer and you're dealing with contractors you know you're it's it's easy to look back in hindsight and say oh they should have done it this way this way but the design does the design in itself it it looks like it should work there's no reason it shouldn't work and it was working it was standing the span was standing um now maybe there was an issue that maybe the engineer should have considered the possibility of uh, this member being overstressed and how that would have affected the rest of the, of the member from from failing and maybe maybe that should have been considered and maybe that's something that'll come out from this investigation maybe the the one of the lessons learned will be that uh and, and, and any design of a post-tension member, you need to consider the possibility of uh, uneven uh, post une uneven tensioning of the pre of the post-tensioning bars, and and that uh, um, the bars should have been considered uh, pre-stressed unevenly, and. And uh, that the bar should have maybe failed before failing the member. And that another issue is maybe these bars should have been designed to fail prior to, if assuming they were overstressed to their ultimate strength, assuming that these bars were stressed past their yield to ultimate. So basically, these bars fail. That having these bars fail before the member fails, so you wouldn't have had a condition where the the member fails and the bridge collapses. So because of the design of, the, of this bridge, basically any member failing, any of these diagonals failing, or even the top or the bottom, any one of these members failing would have caused a collapse of the bridge. And it's just unfortunate. So, so that's my take. There's a lot of theories online. You'll see them. A lot of them are just wrong. They're not based on any sort of engineering principles or uh, anyone with any background in uh, bridges and so hopefully you enjoyed this uh, brief tutorial and and i thank you for watching so uh take care and i and i hope to uh as we find out more information i'll uh i'll put up another video for uh for you to, to watch thank you